that began in 2011, and we've had them 2012, 2013, and 2014. And this is in the last of the series. I call this the New Cities 1.0 um, because there's probably going to be a New Cities 2.0, but it'll be in a slightly different configuration and maybe in a slightly different place. And it could be very interesting, but we have now grown to another place and we have gotten quite a lot of national attention here, whatever that means. And in fact, I was, David doesn't know what this means and I don't know what it means either, but we recently were selected along with the Gerontology Center as top 10 centers and programs in gerontology in the United States. As David said, he could get that from Wall Street and all other places. We don't know the meaning of this, but we do know this, that we didn't ask for it, and it dropped in on us. And so I always say, if someone from the outside says that you've done something good, you don't say, well, it wasn't them who said it. It wasn't them, because almost all of these evaluations, I think, are flawed dramatically as far as I can tell, but at least it suggests that people are beginning to pay attention. We live stream now around the world, whatever that means. Uh, probably not to the Serengeti field where you were last uh, two weeks ago. But uh, so I think one of the main differences in this program, and uh, Leslie who's here today from Georgetown, is that we have shared so much with so many people on the website and now live streaming, and that's not usual. But it's not for me to talk about New Cities 1.0 or 2.0 today because we have Leslie Yancha, got that check uh, <laughs> name, from uh, Georgetown, Texas. Leslie Janka is the executive director of the Georgetown Project, which won one of the MetLife 2013 Best International Cities in the United States. They've been working on their project for 17 years, which is a lesson for us to remember that we're not going to accomplish this very quickly because there are many, many obstacles. And there are many also potential successes if uh, we are uh, flexible enough and stick with it. Hi, David. Uh, welcome. Stick with uh, what we're doing and, and don't be afraid to do it in different ways. 17 years working on an intergenerational project. They have built relationships and partnerships, but not places, although they've changed places, like the theater, in response to what I think is a very, very interesting, uh, welcome, very, very interesting uh, transformation that has occurred in Georgetown, Texas, because of the project. And I don't want to steal any thunder here, but Leslie, um, so I won't talk further about that, but Leslie's a native Texan. You can tell she's from the Lone Star State. She was born near Coleman, Texas, which is in West Texas. She grew up on a ranch. Her father had cattle, <coughs> sheep, and horses, and uh, she went to Texas A&M. Welcome, Rosemary. Come on Hi. in. Texas A&M University and graduated. I didn't ask you what your degree was. In agricultural journalism. Agricultural journalism. So uh, journalism spreads to agriculture and lots of other things, which yes. makes it a useful degree. And uh, 15 years ago, she was appointed executive director of the Georgetown Project. And it is a superb example of what can be done with uh, the intergenerational idea. It can be done in many different ways. Theirs is many ways unique. And I think that we have a lot of um, models from their project that we should adopt here in Lawrence and in other places. And for that reason and others, we have brought uh, Leslie to make a, the Boomer Futures a presentation today. And Leslie, thanks coming all the way. And by the way, I visited the project in February. It was well worth it. It was fun. And she's got a great staff and a great group of people. So Leslie, you're on. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. I'm so happy to be here in Kansas. I've been in Kansas before, but never in Lawrence. And what a beautiful city this is. What a vibrant city. We had such a great time last night down on your main street in our Massachusetts 
Avenue, and it was just wonderful. I have to say one thing. There is no Texas Avenue. I wonder why that is. <laughs> so we have to look into that. There's all the other, all the other states have a name, but Texas. So anyway, it's a great community, and we're so glad to be here. Uh, and we can learn many things from you. I was talking with them earlier about uh, how vibrant uh, the downtown area is and how what a great job that you've done in keeping local businesses um, and keeping that local flair. And I think being a college town certainly uh, does help that. Uh, Georgetown, Texas is about 25 miles north of Austin, Texas right on 35. Interstate 35 splits our community really east and west. And we, over the years, have experienced tremendous growth. From about 1998 to 2008, we had a 67% growth in Georgetown. And typically, every year, we're among the top 10 communities, uh, fastest growing communities in the nation. We think that that's just going to continue. Uh, probably one of the reasons for that is um, uh, probably six, seven years ago, Del Webb Sun City came to our community. And with that, about 8,000 homes and a lot of senior citizens. And so it allowed us the opportunity to really look at that intergenerational community in new and different ways. But we came into the discussion a little bit differently from the youth side. A little more about Georgetown as we obviously are the county seat. It's the home of Southwestern University. And we were the best intergenerational community in 2012. We were also a national promise place for youth from America's Promise in 2011. Uh, number one retirement town in America, uh, best places to retire and reinvent your life, uh, best places to retire. And I noticed we also were recently, I think, number seven in the best communities to start a small business. So it's a really, um, it's a great and vibrant community, but being so close to Austin, Texas, is really going to be changing us. You used to have separation from the communities along 35, and there were still rural areas. Now it's very urban from Austin right on into Georgetown, and that's just going to keep coming. So we're planning for future growth is something that our city is really focusing on in a big way right now. We have about 52,000 in George city of Georgetown proper. And as you can see, we have about 50% of our population is either teenage youth, children and youth, or seniors. So it presents a really great opportunity for us to do some cool things in our communities in linking those generations. A little bit more about Georgetown. As you can see, compared to the state of Texas, we are predominantly white. Again, keep this in mind that this is city of Georgetown proper. Um, you know, a little bit below state averages on uh, poverty level and um, African-American population, a very much growing Hispanic population in our community. But if you look at our school district attendance zone as compared to the city of Georgetown proper, you see some interesting things because obviously we've got about 10,500 students on 18 campuses in our community and that's a much bigger zone than just our city limits. So if you look, some interesting things are happening there between our population, our demographics, between our white population, our Hispanic population. So we have a very uh, much higher Hispanic population in our school district among our students than we do in our city. Another interesting, remember the below poverty line was somewhat low in our city. If you look at our school district, we have 48% economically disadvantaged students that are eligible and qualify for the free and reduced lunch population. Some limited English, 35.8% of our kids are at risk in our school district. And then, but another interesting thing is we have put a very big focus on career and technology education. So we have 77% of our kids that are in CTE classes. And they, last year, had over 430 certifications that were secured by kids in our school district, whether it's CNA, uh, EMT uh, and on from there. So that that's very in a lot of uh, advanced placement courses and dual credit. So what does the Georgetown project do? When we were created, a group of community leaders in Georgetown came together and planned for about 18 months. 
we were seeing things among our youth population that were beginning to worry us. Some gang graffiti, um, early sexual acti activity with our young people, um, juvenile crime on the rise. Many of our kids, about 60% of our parents were working in Austin, so lots of our kids were home alone after school at the middle school level. Uh, so this group just really talked about how can we be proactive about youth development in Georgetown. And what is our foundation for change? Uh, if you're working from the youth side, uh, you always have to have um, research-based practices, in particular to secure funding. And so they looked at a lot of models out there. And what we believed was that it is the important connections between the generations that have the most uh, transformative power in the lives of kids to make the most difference. And so uh, having said that, we wanted to move on with a platform that we felt everyone could embrace. So our vision is one that has been very wonderful for our community because it inspires all adults to make a difference in the lives of kids and everyone has a role. So our vision is that Georgetown will be a community where no child is hungry, hurt, alone, or rejected, and where all children and youth believe that they're loved and respected and treated with dignity. And that has been a rallying cry for our community now for 17 years, and something that uh, organizations, whether it's nonprofit, our city, our chamber, have all gotten behind and embraced that spirit. Our mission is a little bit different because it calls us uh, to do two things, to work at the community level very collaboratively, and I'll talk a little bit about how we do that, but then also to work on identifying services that we have, gaps in those services, and then working to collaborate and try to fill some of those gaps. And that is where the generations come together in many of our programs. So I talked a little bit about the foundation. If you all wanna pick this up, we chose the 40 developmental assets by Search Institute as our foundation for change. And as you look through these, the assets are very um, interconnected with intergenerational components. It is all based upon every adult has the power to make a difference in the life of the child and is essential to that. So the assets really are divided into some external assets such as support and empowerment and boundaries and expectations, constructive use of time, those kinds of things that adults have the power to bring into the lives of youth. And as those are increased, the youth increase internal assets, such as commitment to learning and positive values, social competencies, and positive identity. So these internal assets are not going to be strengthened without the intergenerational connections that reinforce the external assets in youth. So why, why the developmental assets? Search Institute has spent about 50 years researching youth development. And they are research-based, as I said earlier, uh, is very important in youth development, and particularly when you're seeking funding to support your efforts. They want to know that it's a model that has been proven over time. And Search has probably done research with about three to five million youth, children and youth across the country, and in other countries as well. But really the assets are this 40 building blocks of healthy development. And what they are are really those positive experiences and relationships and opportunities and supports that come into the lives of youth as a result of having positive relationships with caring adults. And then also, since 1990, SEARCH, uh, the Developmental Assets Framework, is one of the most widely used uh, foundation for youth development, positive youth development across the globe. So, as we began to see, okay, how are we going to transform how our community thinks about youth development? And how are we going to engage all the generations in that? We really had to do a culture shift. And that was from thinking that we were going to fix young people's problems to promoting young people's strengths. So it is a positive approach to youth development. Also, from programs and developing new programs to the relationships piece. And that's where the intergenerational component is so incredibly important. From doing things for young people to adults and youth doing things together. And that goes from community planning to rec uh, recreational playing tennis at the rec center. So it's all across giving youth a voice in our community and having them work alongside adults. And then from some youth to all young people. 
So we believe that all kids need more assets in their life, irregardless of economic standing, ethnicity, uh, family situations. All youth are at risk and need more assets in their lives. So as you can see, the research behind this foundation, and this has been very popular in our community and something that people get and they understand that they can make a difference if they are uh, working within the developmental assets. Uh, they have very, very much a protective factor for youth. So the more uh, assets that youth have in their lives, you see that they are less likely to engage in those things that really bother us and worry us about our kids, such as alcohol and drug use, violence, illicit drugs, and sexual activity. Also, they have the incredible power to promote positive and thriving behaviors of youth, such as academic success, uh, maintaining good health, valuing diversity and succeeding in school. And most of the outcomes measurement that we have done over the past 17 years verifies uh, this model and proves those outcomes. So how does intergenerational and asset building fit together? It really is the cornerstone because developmental asset building is all about the relationships between adults and youth. And after all of the years of research, the scientists at Search Institute have realized that nothing has more impact in the life of a child than positive and sustained relationships with adults. In our community, and I'm not sure about yours, we have a lot of uh, children and youth that are growing up not around extended family, or they're growing up in single parent households. And so they don't have that link to the generations in their own family. So that's what we're seeing as something positive about what's going on in Georgetown is that our, our senior adults are stepping in and filling that gap in our kids' lives and it's, it's very important and so powerful for them. These are just some things, and I understand uh, you had Intergenerations uh, United here, so you probably have always already heard some uh, characteristics of intergenerational communities. But obviously, providing adequately, adequately for the safety and health, and education, basic needs of life, that they promote programs, policies, and practices that increase cooperation and interaction between the generations. We do that by having youth on our boards across the community and on our senior citizen boards, and there are senior citizen centers uh, working together at that level. On our board, we have a 21 member uh, board of directors, four ex officio, but we have youth from both high schools and from Southwestern University on our board, and they are voting members just like the adults on our board. So they get that experience of working with community leaders on issues and making decisions about the future of our organization. That is also true. We've tried to cultivate that spirit. So now we have youth on the boards of our Chamber of Commerce. We have youth on the boards of our City of Georgetown. They have a youth advisory board. Uh, many of our nonprofits have youth included on their boards. So that's a, been a culture that um, has really been just awesome, quite honestly, because when you give youth the opportunity to really weigh <coughs> in on the future of a community, it is amazing to watch the interactions and how it invigorates um, our community leaders and our older citizens as well. And then it enables all um, ages to share their talents with each other. For example, we have um, a group of citizens out at Sun City, the Sun City Neighborhood Association, that uh, sort of informally formed in a different way called Junior University. And what that group does is they run science fairs in our elementary school. They mentor, they, uh, in some of our uh, elementary schools that are uh, a little less, uh, a little higher need, I will say, uh, and a little less parental involvement, Junior University can go in and they may be playing tennis with those kids. They may be mentoring those kids, as I said, running the science fairs. Um, and just completely engaged in the educational process in our community and in our schools. We have heavy volunteerism with senior citizens in the school district in Georgetown and in our nonprofits as well. For example, we have folks come in, uh, we run a, an after school center for uh, students who are homeless in our community, are living in transition. And so we'll have uh, senior adults come in and just share what they know tell stories about their family and their experiences in life. These are things these kids are not getting 
in their family structure and family situation anymore. We have a gentleman comes in and does woodworking with the kids. Another comes in and teaches paint, painting. And so that's going on really in multiple settings in Georgetown, and you'll see that in just a minute. Okay, identifying needs, we can, again came from the youth side. What does it look like in Georgetown? What do children and youth look like? Um, what is the data telling us about some of their needs, their strengths and their challenges? And so everything we do is really data driven and we start with that. One way that we do this, and I'll leave this here if any of you would like to, but every few years we kind of coordinate it around the census, we will publish the snapshot of Georgetown children and youth. And it's really the only place in our community where you can get multiple aspects of the health and well-being of Georgetown, the data in one place. And so we are now working on the next publication. But what it also does is it allows those folks who maybe don't see the need in our community, the folks in Sun City, and others who are really just looking at it through the lens of our city proper demographics and don't see what the needs are, to look uh, and understand what the needs are with their kids and what they're experiencing. Most people in our uh, area do not realize that almost half of our kids are low income qualified in our school district. It's always a very big surprise. They didn't know that we have kids that are couch surfing in our community. So we start with the data because that gives us a really great opportunity to share and educate. And that's what we do with the, one of our initiatives. And it really starts for a couple of years with just that piece before we move into actual programs. So. We believe that the data, it all starts with the data. And then we have just a few basic parameters for some of our programs and our partnerships. And one, of course, is that it is data driven and that it does fill an identified community need, either with families or youth or older citizens, that's mutually beneficial and collaborative in nature. And by collaborative, I mean really collaborative, sharing goals, vision, um, monitoring outcomes, sharing our resources, sharing our people. Most of our programs are set up that way. And then it is rich in uh, developmental assets and there is a very intentional intergenerational component. So there are things going on across the community where senior adults and young people and fa everyone in between are coming together, but are they really coming together? Are they having those opportunities to connect and get to know one another and share uh, those traits of an intergenerational community and get to know one another at a level that it really matters. And that is what all of our partnerships are designed to do, is to intentionally create those opportunities. And then also committed to evaluation and to measuring outcomes and to always be looking for continuous improvement opportunities. Uh, the last is that everything we're about is increasing the odds that our kids are going to be successful in college or work or life. So, how do we collect our data and how do we mobilize partnerships? We have run for about 17 years, run, I say we have led, uh, the Georgetown Project Collaborative for Children and Youth. And each month, about 30 organizations that serve children, youth, and families in our community come together and meet with us. What that has done for our community um, really is just amazing because when we first started the Georgetown Project, we partnered with LBJ School of Social Work in Austin at UT campus, and they measured what our social service system looked like in Georgetown. And it was very fragmented. Everyone was in their silos doing their own thing, but not, not much collaboration going on. After about 10 years of us coming together on a regular basis, and our community coming together around some common visions and common goals, it's a tightly wound web of referrals and relationships and connections. And that has meant a much stronger safety net of services across the generations in our community, just by building those relationships. A lot of what we do with this group also is that uh, we, we needed better data in our community, quite honestly, across the board. And so we do a lot of that collecting data and sharing that data so that everyone's aware and working on the same page. But we also um, spend a lot of time identifying the resources and mapping our resources in our community. So many people don't know what is available and you have to continue to get the information out about what's there, but more importantly about what's not there. So an example is that 
Uh, about six years ago, we began noticing that these kids were bouncing around in our community without regular places to stay. They were couch surfing. They might be staying in a car. Uh, they might be trying to stay in the park. Yes, in Georgetown, Texas. Um, and, and so we really had, um, had studied this for a while. And what we were seeing was it really was growing from just, um, um, it became a trend is what I'm trying to say. It really moved from just an issue we were paying attention to, an emerging issue, to a trend, to where we were identifying a couple of hundred kids each year in our school district who qualified as homeless under the McKinney-Vento Education Act. So this group rallied together, and we began an awareness campaign in our community. And what that allowed us to do was to first educate, but also mobilize resources and talent and the hearts of our community. So long story short, what happened was we moved to that from a real entire community-wide uh, collaborative project into opening a drop-in center and a shelter for homeless teens and for uh, the shelter actually serves zero to 17 in our community. So that took about four to five years to get to that point. But I think, you know, perseverance is everything. <laughs> and so just sticking with it, uh, you know, does actually yield results in the end. But we have a community that has a huge heart for kids, and the adults in our community have embraced that as well. And it would have never been successful if all the generations had not come together to do that. So some of the outcomes are that we have the stronger network of support for our kids and families, and we're streamlining referrals. So we're also looking at some new technologies to be able to do that electronically. Did, did you also have a shelter for seniors and families that work side by side or in collaboration or anything? And there, is, there is not a senior shelter in the community. We have many uh, retirement communities there in Georgetown, uh, assisted living, um, you know, nursing home mm -hmm. facilities, um, and the whole gamut. Uh, there is not a senior shelter. We have the senior centers. Uh, there's Meals on Wheels program there, um, which uh, is wonderful. And, and so, um, but no senior shelter in the community. We had no youth shelter either. The closest was about, you know, probably 15 miles up the road in Round Rock, Texas. But what we learned is that people don't want to go to another community for shelter. You know, they want to stay in their own community. So I think that's an opportunity, issues like that, even for us to begin to work more collaboratively on senior issues, even though that we are a youth development organization. But we have a model in place that has been successful and can certainly be uh, used to work in, in close tandem with seniors. We had an aging initiative some years back that began to collect some data about seniors in our community and began to publish that data. And some, it was interesting because some of the, the gaps and services and things they would like to see in our community were almost exactly what the youth said. You know, transportation. We don't have public transportation in Georgetown. And it was so cool last night to see your buses running, you know, because we've really worked on trying to get something started, but it's, it's huge for a city to begin public transportation. And the fact that you all have done that is really, is really amazing. And it's, it's a model I'm going to take back and, and talk to our community about. Uh, because it's so important for those seniors and our kids in need to be able to access services. We have wonderful services, but if you can't get to them, that's an issue. So that's something that we're talking about, and regionally as well, because we have the I-35 corridor, and they're working on transportation opportunities up and down that corridor from Austin um, out through Georgetown as well. Okay, the Assets in Action Program, and that is really um, the community piece of what we do. It's taking the assets out to communities in our county, in our city. We work with organizations and we train uh, kids and adults on the assets. We work with communities across the nation and across the globe. We have worked with Sao Paulo, Brazil. We have worked with uh, communities in South Africa, and so, by working with a Search Institute uh, and getting some mobilization started and in, with the assets and in becoming a community vision, um, we have the opportunity to work with lots of communities who are trying to do similar things. And so that's been really great for us to share what we've learned in our outcomes. 
and we do have a community vision. Many uh, organizations in Georgetown work toward that vision that I read uh, to you earlier of the Georgetown project. So that is really um, across the community. Okay. In, st in 2000, we noticed that there was very little organized support for parents in our community. And we wanted to, uh, to get the word out that if you're going to make a difference, it's best to start at birth. And it would be nice to think that all parents have the parenting skills and that it comes naturally, but we all need help from time to time in raising kids. And so we created the Bridges to Growth Parent Center. And through that center, we partner with our Georgetown Health Foundation, with parents in our local churches. And we offer parenting throughout the community. And we also offer training for child care providers in our community to come and um, access training for their continuing education. And what we've seen with that program really is that we have more confident parents and grandparents. We have quite a few grandparents that come into the center that have found themselves raising their grandchildren. And they come and say, "What well, we need help. And so through support groups and parent training uh, and, and some family counseling that's offered through the center, we're able to help those grandparents and other parents who are seeking support. So we see more confidence in our parents, just knowing them knowing that there is a place in the community where they can go for help. Also, high quality child care centers. Obviously those early enriching environments and the adults are primarily in charge of those environments are huge on setting our kids on a path of success. So that we work on that and then uh, we work a lot on school readiness. So what we're finding out is lots of parents and grandparents don't really understand what the readiness requirements are when their grandchildren or children are going into school. So we spend a lot of time talking about what those are and connecting our early childhood professionals in our school district with parents and grandparents so that that relationship is there before the kids ever get to school. We had an opportunity to develop the Kids City program and this program is really the catalyst for the free summer food program in our school district. It's our longest running program and it's for elementary students who are K through fifth grade and qualified for the free and reduced lunch program. And we have adult in involvement and in intergenerational connections going all through this program and all the programs that I'm talking about. Um, so we needed, we needed to address the fact that some of our kids don't have good nutrition and enriching activities over the summer break. So we developed Kid City uh, with that need in mind. And so these kiddos come in and they get a good breakfast and they have enriching activities all in between that are intergenerational. The school district gives us an opportunity to run the program on their campuses, on our campuses. And then uh, they are field trip based. So the kids are getting out into the community and experiencing things that they would not otherwise get, get to experience in the summer and have that summer camp experience like their peers. So we have local businesses who allow our kids to come on and bowl and see free movies and those kinds of things. Swim, our Parks and Recreation Department is a partner. They allow us to swim at a local pool. It's entirely for kids, city kids every week. And they help in, in managing the, the camp as well. So we're sharing our people, we're sharing our resources, and we're sharing our locations. So again, it's that collaborative nature of developing programs and sustaining them. And this program has been around for as long as we have 17 years, funded by a private foundation in our city of Georgetown. Another identified need is we had no quality after school programming at the middle school level in Georgetown when we started this program back in 1998. And so again, we mobilized partnerships. The school district provides the space. We share staff. Um, school district provides transportation and so we offer the ASAP program after school action program on all three middle school campuses during the school year we run summer camps with it in the summer so what's happening with the ASAP kids right now is they're probably on a bus headed to a field trip at a local business where we have adults who walk them through what it takes to have that career and a lot of what we do in ASAP is we try to link careers of the future, careers that they're interested in with what they're learning in school. So really linking that academic piece to real life. Uh, also, uh, very intergenerational, we have senior citizens, 
everyone in our community come in and share their talents with these kids. And it's just huge because a lot of the kids in ASAP are also high-risk kids and don't have the resources to have some of these experiences on their own. What we've seen is better grades, better attendance, better test scores, standardized test scores, um, and better behavior during the school day. So we've got you know, 15 years of data that proves that this is a successful program that works. If we can get kids connected into this positive experience after school, it's going to make a difference during the school day. And the intergenerational piece is so important. We, the kids are into robotics now because that's developing their STEM skills, uh, and they don't know it. They're having fun, so, but they're really building their science and technology and engineering and math skills. And so we have adults in the community that come in and judge their robotics competitions, help them build their robots. You know, we, we just have a wealth of experience, uh, as you all have in your communities, that can make such a huge difference, uh, a mutual difference, because it really engages the senior population as well. So um, ASAP's been around quite a long time. Again, you'll notice some common themes in our partnerships. City of Georgetown, the school district, parks and recreation, um, and the business community. We're a very small nonprofit. Um, I've in included our annual report, if any of you are interested over there, because it'll kind of show you the number of kids that we serve and the resources that we have, which is really uh, not all that much. And so we're able to continue doing these programs and to fill these needs in our community by mobilizing partnerships and collaborating. Okay, this is our most recent program, and I've already talked a little bit about the NEST, but since we've opened the NEST, um, we have really seen some interesting outcomes. We've also been able to expand the program very quickly because of the community support. Georgetown is absolutely wonderful when you put out a call to action. Um, and, and from our perspective, it's been about kids. But we need adults, and we need grandparents and parents and adults of all ages to help uh, fill these needs and to support our kids in their healthy development. And they rally. It is just amazing what the community has done to help us get this project uh, here so quickly. But what we've seen in our drop-in center, it is for high school kids, those kids I talked about that are just bouncing around out there in the community. They're able to come in after school, get a hot meal, wash their clothing, take a shower, uh, get some help with their homework, and then build, just build relationships. They don't have that regular caring adult in their life. And so that stability from, from just that, we're seeing, we have about a 99% passing rate among the high school students served at the Nest Drop-In Center. About a 98% is a little up from when I prepared this graduation rate. So at, at its base, the Nest program is dropout prevention. But what we do is build relationships among the generations. We have um, kids in there who have been mentored by, um, we have a retired doctor in the community who comes in and just answers questions with the kids about the health, their health. And so we have kids now who want to go into the medical profession and have made plans to get into college and pursue that. We have young men who linked with veterans in our community that have decided to go into the service and then also uh, pursue their, their uh, musical career to play in the Navy band or whatever the case may be. So what we see by having the intergenerational component is that we see kids dreaming again. They've moved beyond the daily chaos of their lives to thinking, I can do this. You know, I can get to school the next day. I can stay in school if I have a dream and a goal that I feel like I can get and I'm passionate about. And that's what's huge. And what's happening from the adult side is that they've taken genuine interest in these kids' lives. And that happens across all the programs. Many of our kids start in Kid City when they're in the in uh, kindergarten. And they may come up through our ASAP program in the middle school, go right into our, our high school programming. And so we have the ability to really see some long-term outcomes, which is sometimes very rare in youth programming. But we also get to see that power of the intergenerational connections. With Southwestern University. We started it through a Texas Department of Health grant 
um, a, a couple of years before we actually formed the CIP program, and we had some funds from the state to set up some youth development projects in six diverse neighborhoods in our community. And following that, um, we had a unique opportunity with Southwestern University to form the only off-campus work-study partnership. So what we learned through that was that students in our community uh, are so bright and they're seeking to get engaged in our community rather than just being in college and not a, a real part of the community, that it really filled both needs. It also allowed us to give college students an opportunity to gain job skills and to really become work ready by working through our programs and in programs in our partners as well. So that's been going on for quite some time and students in our community work through the Georgetown Project in all of our programs. And it really increases our capacity uh, because we're a small staff. We have one full-time staff member and you're looking at her. <laughs> and the rest of our staff, there's four others that work part-time. So again, you know, I can't drive home enough uh, the importance of these collaborations and, and not having to do it all yourself. <coughs> So, our goal really in Georgetown is just to build a community where everyone is valued and have the opportunity to thrive across the generations. And I wanted to share with you just a, a few things here where we have intentionally um, built an environment of intergenerationality in many places, not in one location. So, obviously, Southwestern University has Senior University, and it is a series of classes for seniors in our community. But they're on campus, they're interacting with, with students, and students are a part of that. So they're being able to get the intergenerational uh, activity right there at Senior University. Williamson County Museum, obviously we're the county seat, so this is our county museum. They have the hands-on history museum, so they have senior citizens and adults in our community come in and do activities related to the history of Williamson County with our kids. They also take trunks out into all of our schools and educate as well. And many of their volunteers that increase their capacity are senior citizens in our community. So they're working with the kids. The Recreation Center. This was a, a really interesting uh, process. We've always had a Recreation Center, but some years back, uh, the kids in our community rallied. We did not have the things we have now, like movie theaters and bowling alleys and all of the things uh, that are in Georgetown, and they said, we really need a place to be, and we want it to be safe, uh, we want it to be drug-free, and we want a diverse set of activities for, for all kinds of kids. And so they began to put um, PowerPoints together, and it was called a place of our own, and they sort of took their show on the road and tried to sell this to our city council and our community. And all the time, they had adults supporting that interest of theirs and encouraging them and making sure that they got to go and present to clubs in our community. But along the way, something really interesting happened. They said, what about our senior citizens? How about we take a look at doing something together? So it really moved from a teen center to a teen slash senior center. And so what happened was they were compelling enough that they convinced our city council to put the expansion of the rec center and renovating a space for a teen slash senior center on the bond election, which passed overwhelmingly. So it was really a, a cool process. The kids learned so much. They spent a lot of time in Sun City. Obviously, there was a lot of voting power out there. And so uh, the adults really appreciated the fact that the kids were empowered to come and include them in that process. And it made it, uh, it was just a rewarding experience for all. And some of the kids who actually worked on this knew that they would be gone before it ever came to fruition, and they were. But when we opened, they came back and celebrated the opening of that, and it was really a very cool experience. I will say, this got a little bit of a slow start, and I'll tell you why. Um, you know, not, not all folks are comfortable around teenagers. You know, and so what we noticed in the beginning was that a lot of our seniors were leaving about the time school cut out. <laughs> and so, you know, um, we, that told us we really need to create some opportunities, some fun opportunities for them to come together. So we started doing intergenerational pool uh, tournaments 
chess tournaments, and things that really intentionally united those generations in fun activities. So that they could just get used to one another and learn to talk to each other. And so it's really cool. There's always something intergenerational going on at the Georgetown Teen Center slash Senior Center. Our library, we have a very vibrant library. It has a children's zone, lots of children's programming. Again, a number of our volunteers at our library are senior citizens. And so they come in and help the library run these programs. We talked a little bit about the parks and trails, and here's the book up here, but uh, we have an extensive trail system in Georgetown. Lots of families use our trail. It actually runs from our city almost out to our lakes. And it, it's really gorgeous. Dennis got the opportunity to ride the trail in about, was it 30 degree weather or whatever. <laughs> so he had a short ride on the trail when he came down. But um, it's, it's meant a lot just for families in our community to get out, become healthy and active. And you see lots of our senior citizens using the trail system. <coughs> We also try to unite our generations through community events. So we have um, our Wesley Fest, which is a Wesley and Homes, a retirement home each year. Brings lots of intergenerational activity between uh, families in our community. The museum I talked about does something very cool. It's Chisholm Trail Days. We were on the, a, a stop on the Chisholm Trail, the cattle drive. And so they have a cattle drive through the park and there's a lot of living history kinds of exhibits, which seniors in our community help to run those. Um, you know, whether it's a camp cookout or um, they can rope, um, you know, a calf or, or whatever. And so they're very engaged with that as well. Our annual large festival in our community is the Red Poppy Festival. And it brings in probably 50 to 60,000 people to our community each April. Also very intergenerational. Lots of booths, lots of activities. There's a, a children's area, and many times our senior citizens are helping man those areas at our festivals and connect with the kids. Our Christmas stroll, obviously, is tons of fun. Uh, there's Santa's workshop, again, an area set up for the generations to come together. And we always make sure that our senior citizens have a place in those things and that we actively seek their involvement. And I think that's one thing. We had so many seniors coming into our community with Sun City, but we had to reach out and let them know how we needed help. So I think oftentimes, you know, that, that needs to come both ways from the community uh, reaching out and saying, here's what we need. We value you. We think we need your involvement. It's important. And we've had great success with people jumping in and, and becoming involved. Festival of the Arts. Um, we have a Georgetown Symphony Society, partners with Southwestern University, very intergenerational. Uh, in the county, they form Vivace, which is a youth orchestra, and uh, the adults in the community work with the youth, and they perform as well, and they're absolutely stunning. We also try to unite through education and service. We have about 800 mentors that work in our community. In community schools, and the majority of those are Southwestern students and Sun City residents. So they have, are very, very involved. There are many retired educators in Sun City. And also what I said earlier about just sharing their talents, going into classrooms and talking about their experiences is so inspirational for kids. And that's something easy that anybody can do. Uh, it just have given the opportunity. Our school district valued it so much that they created a mentoring coordinator position for our school district. <coughs> and so that's what she does. She links needs in the classroom, as well as our partners in education department, uh, our organization. They link the needs in the classroom and they find those resources in the community and plug them in. And many times that is our senior citizens filling those needs. That's our program, the After School Action Program. We do lots of gardening in that program. Again, another program where we sneak in those STEM skills and improving their math and their science and language arts through gardening. So they're junior master gardeners in our ASAP program that get their training and certification. And we have uh, adults in the communities and seniors come out and garden with the kids. Juvenile Justice has a service learning component. These are kids that have you know, maybe not made the best choices, but 
they're given opportunities through our juvenile justice center, which is really amazing. They've adopted the assets. And so if you walk through the halls of our juvenile justice center where kiddos are in there because they've made some poor choices, what you see is empowerment, service, um, you know, uh, positive use of positive identity, self-esteem, all of these positive messages of the assets surround them. And so one of them is service learning that they've really taken to heart. So they get our juvenile justice kids out while they have them, and some are there for different lengths of time, and then they may be on probation, so they require them to have service. And so part of what they do there is they learn uh, how wonderful it is to help others. And it's, it's really transformational for many of them who have never had the opportunity Brookwood in Georgetown. This is a, one of the newer nonprofits and partners in the community. And we did not have really anything for our special needs population of students to do once they aged out of the public school system. So Brookwood in Georgetown is modeling um, a, an organization in Houston, Texas, um, and would like to become residential at some point. But what they've done is they have partnered with churches in the community that have given them a place to grow sunflowers or to make trail mix or to do pottery. So these kids can now go into their enterprises. Brookwood Big in Georgetown call them their citizens and so they sell what they make in our stores locally. And so again, our churches, faith community, our senior citizens are hugely important to this because they are the volunteers that work with uh, the citizens. Sun City, again, helps in so, so many ways. I don't know if I told you about um, the group that goes in and teaches tennis lessons. I think I may have mentioned that um, in one of our local elementary schools. And, and most of the guys in this group are 80 plus. And they are out there playing, I could not keep up with them. Uh, you know, they're very fit and they love tennis and they go in and introduce tennis to these kids. And then they'll support them if they need a racket or whatever. So they, they just adopt that school. We've got a lot of groups that maybe will adopt a certain school and just provide things that they need. But again, it's our senior population very engaged with that. So that is really about all that I have. I, I would be glad to answer any questions. I so appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm really intrigued with the new cities and the boomer futures. Uh, we also are facing that in Central Texas, and uh, I think we can learn from you all as well. And I hope, I hope if, if you've gained nothing from sharing our model, it's that adults have huge, immense power to be important to change the lives of kids in your community, wherever you are. And I would encourage you to seek out those opportunities and uh, take advantage of those because what we see it is mutually rewarding. And it's, it's really uh, improved the odds that our kids are gonna be successful when they leave Georgetown. So. You're talking about how it changes the life of the kids. Uh, do you have some measures in terms of how it changes the lives of seniors? Of seniors? Yeah. Basically what we're doing in terms of measuring the seniors, because we're coming from the youth side primarily, is we're going to be working with groups to help them do some measurements and to begin to collect that. Right now it's through focus groups and evaluations of their volunteer experience. Uh, but I would love to see uh, organizations in our community get very focused about doing the same thing for seniors that we've tried to do with youth. And I think that's where we can certainly help and help move that forward and be of service. That you're exactly right. Uh, that measurement for our kids is we survey with the developmental assets profile survey. Uh, we're doing some really uh, neat new research projects around perseverance. And what, uh, what Search has done is spent some time talking to people across the country, uh, educators, uh, faith, uh, youth leaders in churches, youth program, nonprofit, youth development leaders saying, what do you think is one of the most important traits for kids in being successful? What, have, what made you successful? And the number one thing was stick to itness or perseverance. Uh, just understanding that you're not going to be successful all the time. You know, kids oftentimes will think, I'm 
I'm not smart. And that, that's a label that they take on. And so working with them to see you can improve your intelligence. You know, you can persevere. There's a lot to be said for the small successes along the way. So we're going to be doing some work with search on validating new perseverance process, uh, processes and surveys that we hope get integrated um, throughout the nation, really. Uh, working on that, they did an interesting thing with Avatar. You all will like this. Uh, they did a, a, a survey, a, a, a research project of where they worked with a bunch of youth that were uh, teens, early teens, and they allowed them all to create an avatar, if you all, you all know what an avatar is, of themselves when they're like 75. And then they let them talk to themselves. So it was like current self talking to future self. And what they learned from that was that from that process, they saw uh, the youth involved more interested in saving for retirement, more interested in setting goals, and how they're going to follow through with those goals, and in determining careers and interests uh, in, in future careers that early uh, as a young teen. So it was really cool when they connected themselves to what they will be someday um, and how that changed their vantage point. And so that's a, that I got off track, but yes, we do not measure the senior outcomes beyond uh, their experience in volunteering and in uh, making a difference with the child that they're working with. But I'm glad you brought that up because I know I'm going to go talk to you. Uh, uh, if, if I understand this right, the Georgetown Project, you're the director of it and you have a I couple am. of part-time people working for you. Yes, sir. And it looks to me like you do a terrific job of getting a lot of other organizations to work together, which is a real challenge. Now, who funds you and your staff? I have a, that's one reason I provided this for you all, so you can kind of see where our funding comes from. But we're funded, we have a diverse base of funding. And primarily it is from grants, it is from private contributions, annual giving, uh, some contracts, and special events. So we, we are a little bit heavy, probably in the grants, funding because I like to see a little bit better mix than what we have because those come and go. We've been very fortunate to work with some foundations in our city and other funders that have stayed with us over time. And I think that's because we've been able to prove our outcomes. And we've, we've been able to keep them as a partner by sharing those outcomes and because it's collaborative in nature. It's not just give us funding and then we're going to go do our thing and <coughs> report at the end of the year. We really have that relationship with our funders. So we are about 50, let's see, 53% grants right now. That's at the end of 13. And then the next is our special event. We have one special event of year, but we have others in the community who have fundraisers for us. And so that's very helpful too. And then our annual giving, just from people who care about our work in our community, is about 20%. And then the least is, uh, we do raise money. We're the fiscal agent for our school district for helping those families who are qualified as homeless in our district. So we raise funds in the community to support those uh, those families in the district. So it's a, it's a pretty broad base. We did have federal funding for about 10 years through drug prevention, uh, drug-free community support program grant. And that's really when we were able to have that um, security of multi-year funding, even though we had to apply each year. But we had it the entire amount that we could. So after you received it for 10 years, you had to take a break. And that happens, uh, or you couldn't apply again for that particular funding. And that's really what got us started with a lot of our asset initiatives with our after school program in the middle school because it was a, a drug prevention program really at its core. Oh my gosh, you know, what are we going to do? We're losing this huge amount of funding every year. But what happened was we made a conscious decision to stay away from the federal funding and the state funding for a while and really take this back to our community because we feel that you know our residents have the, the best opportunity for making a difference with our kids. And so it allowed us to get a lot smarter about how we talked about our outcomes, about the partnerships that we formed, um, a lot more effective with our dollars because we had to work really hard for them. Uh, and then we had to, to prove up our outcomes. And so that's been very good. I think also we had some staff transition, a former director left and uh, so we just needed to kind of shore up our organization, our goals for the future. 
uh, we're about to, we're in the last year of our five year strategic plan and we're beginning strategic planning for the next three to five years. And I'm so excited to look forward because looking back through our plan, um, we were able to work on all aspects of our plan because we stay very focused. Everything we do ties in with our plan. And, but also, we have a great board, and they're very supportive about seizing really unique opportunities, like what I told you about the perseverance. We're going to be working with that project that um, is an opportunity for us uh, to really get some new uh, research about our kids, new data about our kids. So, you know, I think um, we are at a good point to where we may want to look at some more substantial funding uh, streams going forward, but it's really, um, I think, been good for us to stay away from the federal and state funding and uh, just focus on uh, those who really care about our work and those Sounds foundations. Like a good check <laughs> Yeah. Yes, yes. We, you know, I keep going back to Sun City because that's the largest con uh, concentration of senior adults in our community, but we obviously have many more seniors that don't live in Sun City. But, um, you know, it's been a huge, uh, infusion of not just support of time and talents but of resources because we've been able to connect with several family foundations out there that their mission really connects with our mission and have gotten very involved with us and it's you know it's a it's a really uh, mutually beneficial relationship and uh, you know just much more rewarding than uh, doing going for a federal grant and then having to do what all comes with that when you get it. <laughs> so, you know, as our staff uh, kind of took a downturn there after the federal grant uh, left that I told you about, we just really didn't have the capacity to continue managing those kinds of grants. But we're there again, and, I, and we're probably going to look at that. Because it's, it's very difficult. As a nonprofit, you are always looking for funds. You know, it's, it's just part of the job. And we have quite a vibrant and many nonprofits in Georgetown. I think there are about 75 in our very small community. So. You write your own grants? I do, yes. And, and like I said, um, we probably would not have been able to sustain some of our services if we didn't have that collaboration with our partners. Whereas, uh, you know, they're putting up staff and facilities and and things just like we are. So being able to blend that has, has truly been what's allowed us to um, sustain our programming. What do you think's been your key to encouraging collaboration in your program? I think it really started with our vision. Uh, you know, I, I can't stress the importance enough of having a vision that inspires people. Um, and then also being uh, very positive because the developmental assets are about strength-based, strength and it's a positive approach. So it really allows us to talk about the good things in kids rather than the things that are you too often hear, you know, that are negative. And so I think having that positive approach um, is really something that folks can rally around. And then also being open uh, to collaborating. You know, a, a lot of times as funds get tight uh, across the country, Nonprofits get very uh, focused on, you know, that's my funding source, and you know, we do this, and y'all do that, and yes, and, and that's tough. But I think because we've worked for 17 years on the collaborative spirit by bringing nonprofits together around this common vision, that it's just really a different, it's a different atmosphere in our community as a result of that. You had mentioned the transportation, getting people to facilities to be able to participate. How much attention or is it even on the radar the actual architecture and the spatial arrangements of these places to allow people, and just because you can get there doesn't mean you can get in the door or use a restroom or you know enjoy the space. Absolutely, that is, that is one thing that they have been very focused on is accessibility. Okay. Uh, absolutely. The transportation piece is not there. I don't know when we're going to get there, but I'm going to go back and tell them about what you've done here. <laughs> because we have a university and, and, you know, we have a city and there's, we could, we should be working together to try to get this done. But it's very expensive for cities and it just takes time. So when you did the Peer Senior Center, yes, that was all 
that renovation, accessibility and universal design, all that was considered during those renovations. Absolutely. Collaborations with the planning department to allow those things. Is there, are they a part of this network? Like are they on board? Yes, we have city representatives on our collaborative and they are obviously funding partners in quite a number of our uh, initiatives. So they're, they're very involved, but they're also very focused on accessibility. Okay and uh, you know within all of city services and locations for sure and most of our programs are either in city buildings or school district buildings so just in terms of our services we have that accessibility uh, we did take an opportunity to go into an old school building for the nest drop-in center because when we we own a home where we had the shelter and when we turned that into a shelter we had to move the drop-in center out and so this is this is just a perfect example, really, of how things often happen in Georgetown. Um, the school district knew that we were going to be looking for a location for the drop-in center, or we were probably going to have to just stop that piece because our goal was always overnight shelter. So <coughs> they were moving our. We have an alternative high school called Rashard Day High School, and they were moving those students over to the annex of our one of our nice high schools, and. They had no plans for this building. So a couple conversations with the superintendent. Yes, move the drop-in center into the old Richard Day High School. We will lease it to you for a dollar a year. And so within you know a day or two, we had a location. And in that project, um, we have different churches that bring these hot meals to the kids every night. And that's been going on for two and a half years. So each night, a different church or women's group or service club shows up after school with a hot meal for these kids. And so, you know, that's just kind of how it happens. You put out a, a, a plea for help and everyone jumps in. And I think that's that's really something cool about Georgetown. But it's probably just... Do you coordinate volunteers for getting the food? Or? Yes, we do. Yes, we have a coordinator there at the drop-in center. And she works with all, there's a schedule set up. We have some churches that have been bringing food for two and a half since we opened. So they just love it so much, you know. They get to connect with the kids and they, they just have a heart for what the, the kids are going through. And uh, they're really passionate. And most of those actually are seeing, are the majority are senior citizens doing that. I, I wanted to build on my last question and it has to do with you have homeless children and in, in our community here we've, we've had some homeless adults and we've had homeless families mm -hmm. um, I'm not aware but it's it's quite possible that we've had homeless children that are independent I mean I'm, I'm just curious about the, the the dynamics of that how did that happen that you these children don't have homeless parents or extended family members are they kicked out is, is there a, a lot of times at the high school like that? level that is that is the case um, and we really had to kind of work through those issues you know are you enabling kids but I, and that's a perception that's out there but I will tell you from the kids that we've served that is not the kids that we're serving I mean these kids are out there of no fault of their own the majority of time but we finally had to get to a place as a board and an organization saying for whatever reason they're out there and we want them to be safe and well fed and we want them to have the tools that they need to get to school ready to learn the next day and we want them to graduate and so that's we just had to get to that place to say you know whatever reason we're going to help them on that we're going to offer counseling we're going to offer you know our goal is family reunification if that's safe and practical for them uh, but for whatever reason they're out there, they're kids in our community and, and we want them to get on a path of success so that when they leave Georgetown they have some plan for the future and that's our goal there and that's going actually really well. It's amazing how resilient kids are uh, with just a few supports in their life, just something stable, you know, whether that's a hot meal or whatever, just kind of uh, reduces the tension just a little bit and allows them to think forward and so uh, that relationship piece but also about what what you're asking about the kids there is no family shelter in our community again it's up in Round Rock but what we learned is that was really beyond our capacity um, 
our ministerial alliance had worked on this issue for a while. It gets to the point of funding. It becomes something big, and it was just more than an alliance of churches, you know, could take on. There was no one to take the lead on it and manage it. So they came to us and said, would you take this on? And we really didn't know what we were getting into, we, you know, at the time. But we are about filling the gaps uh, for kids. And so, you know, it took a long time to put that partnership together. But uh, we knew that we needed a, a child placement partner because in our um, shelter, it's birth to 21, or birth to 17, I'm sorry. So you have to, you know, have, have some licenses to be placing kids, adolescents in shelter. And so we did partner with that shelter right up the road. Now our thinking is hopefully one day they'll come into our community with a little support. So we brought them in as a partner um, and that we're doing that host home shelter together. So to give them a leg up in our community and support and visibility in our community that they can hopefully expand their services there. They're also helping us with counseling for our kids and our families. Once they go into the shelter, the families start uh, interacting and getting counseling together to see if there's possible placement, safe placement back with the family. But it, it is a challenge. Um, I think you have to think of homeless in a new way too, and that was part of our uh, awareness campaign is in a school district, there is what is called the McKinney-Vento Homeless Education Act. And so any student it broadens that definition of homeless beyond just living on the street. Um, you know, it's if you're in a shelter, if you are not living with a legal guardian. Uh, so that, so it, allowed, it allows the district to reach out and support those kids who are transitioning all the time. We've served students that have probably stayed in 10 different places in a school year. And, you know, you can imagine what that does uh, just to, you know, being able to stay focused on school. Uh, so, you know, it expands uh, that kind of definition. And so we really had to say, when we say homeless, this is what we mean. And, and then the community was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Now I understand because they don't see homeless uh, people on our streets in Georgetown. You know, uh, and for many years, if there were homeless people on the street, they just, you know, uh, they were gone. I don't know really what, where we took them. <laughs> but, um, you know, they were assisted to other areas, I will say. And so, um, you know, it was really a, an awareness challenge. But, um, you know, as I said, it, it's, we have a great community for understanding the issue and rallying to support. And so I think that just comes from years of uh, cultivating that spirit in a community. I hope that we have a family shelter someday. We need it. I really appreciated your focus on the importance of data and that you really want to get data on elders as well as kids. And it reminded me of a project we did in Kansas about 15 years ago that I was involved with, and I think Rosemary too, it was the Kansas Elder Camp. Do you remember yeah, that? I, with, I actually started that one. You, you yeah. started it, okay, with and Mercedes was and, involved. Uh -huh, yep. and yeah, yeah, and um, it just made me wish we still had that going, and because I thought it was so useful. It was useful to researchers, it was useful to nonprofits, it was useful for politicians, and. Um, maybe you can speak to that, Rosemary, of, of like, do you see the value in that something like that going again? Oh, absolutely. It's, it's always a funding issue. And that leads to a question maybe you answered while I was out of the room. Where does your funding come from? Yes, um, we, it, it's a diverse space through grants, uh, special events, some contracts for services. Um, uh, oh, and annual giving. You know, just folks who make annual donations or pledges to the organization. So majority grants and annual giving. And you get public funds? We do, yes. From their schools or? Um, schools are more with in-kind services, uh -huh. just like the city with in-kind services, the facilities matches, salary matches with their staff that help us run programs collaboratively. Um, so we, we don't pay for any facilities. So our programs run in school districts and in the city buildings. And then, and then we have uh, Register Both Parent Center is in a building run by our Health Foundation. We have a really um, amazing Georgetown Health Foundation that is very progressive and looks at health and well-being uh, as a whole child and as a whole community. Uh, and so they, they are uh, one of our largest funders as well uh, of what we do. But our Parent Center is in the Community Resource Center. The Georgetown Project was actually the catalyst for that center 
Uh, we've been an anchor agency in it, um, you know, since it started. And now it in itself is a collaboration. It's a center where uh, nonprofits can co-locate. And uh, we hope to take that bigger someday to where we have more of a campus approach, you know, and we can all get back together. But um, there's about, I guess, six or eight nonprofits that co-locate in the Georgetown Community Resource Center, and our Bridges to Growth Parent Center is one of those in the center. And so it's great where families can kind of go and have a one-stop place to uh, access various services that they don't need. In terms of outcomes, uh, it occurs to me that there are some of the areas that easily get uh, brushed over. So I was wondering if you can speak to outcomes in terms of teen sexual assaults or teen pregnancies or the development of progressive sexuality education for teens through the program. Uh, and what about the LGBT teens in Georgetown? Yes, there are uh, groups on our campuses. There are support groups for, for those populations of students. Um, I will say that that is a, a, one of the factors we see a lot with our kids who are coming into the nest and have been either kicked out or um, left home. Uh, related to that issue, the LGBT. Um, in terms of uh, early pregnancies, uh, we saw an upswing in our teen pregnancies uh, some years back, but that has leveled off now. Um, we have a teen parenting coordinator um, in the school district who is also our after school action program coordinator. So you've got um, a person who is teaching these resilience and and uh, self-respect skills going up through middle school that's then at the high school level working with our teen, teen parents. So we've seen a real reduction in the number of young women who, um, who are pregnant parenting as teens. Uh, we have Annunciation Maternity Home in our community, which is a great maternity home and also a charter school, a UT charter school. So young women who uh, don't have a place to be, who are, um, who are pregnant or, or parenting, I think I think they can stay up to age two, maybe age one, in Annunciation, but they it's a wonderful environment. Um, I think there's 35, 40 beds maybe out there um, for young women, and they can also go to school there. So there's that big focus of staying in school and getting your education. Uh, we did lose some funds within the district for uh, child care for our parenting teens, um, and so uh, that is really um, one gap that we have right now, uh, that we were not able to sustain that um, for free child care for our parenting uh, teens who are attending schools in Georgetown. Um, in regards to substance abuse, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about that because that was our learned uh, during that time was... Um, that you have to be vigilant. Substance abuse is probably never going to go away with young people. But staying vigilant and keeping um, prevention programs, positive alternative activities in the community, such as service events, the teen center, those positive things for kids to be in, like the after school programs. We have a great boys and girls club with two locations in Georgetown. So that's expanded. That's a great uh, partner as well. Uh, we saw our substance abuse, reported substance abuse numbers decrease by 25% over a 10-year period where we were able to focus on those prevention strategies. Now, again, that's something that we really need to work on going forward because that level of funding has not been replaced. But what has come in its place are new programs like Boys and Girls Club and, and others that have expanded and work on those life skills and those uh, empowerment skills all the time. So we've seen very good outcomes with substance abuse. Uh, our teen pregnancy numbers are going down. Um, and I forgot the other one that you asked about. Oh, the LGBT. Yes, that's, that's been an issue. Um, and, and we addressed that, our school district addressed that um, over some bullying issues that happened. And so they implemented a No Place for Hate campaign in all of our school districts. And it's really working to change that school climate uh, to be more accepting of diverse populations. But there are support groups for uh, the kiddos on the all uh, high school campuses. I, I don't think you've talked about this, but <clears throat> I noticed that the 
Georgetown was named the number one retirement town in America in 2011. Uh, top 10 best places to reinvent your life in retirement. We've talked about reinvention here too. 2010, 25 best places to retire, 2011. We are, have, as one of our missions or goals in the Douglas County Senior Services to undertake uh, action to improve Barnes as a retirement attractive place. And I just wondered, what did Georgetown do uh, that created this strong uh, citation, you know, in several different places to make you the number one retirement community there? I've been to Georgetown. It's a lovely place, no question about it. But number one, and <laughs> what is it that we might learn from you that we could adopt here or think about, particularly in our um, strategic planning? Um, I think probably what raised the, us to the national uh, the national conscience on that was the Del Webb community. Uh, the Sun City community, as I said, it's 8,000 homes in our community. So Del Webb is a national developer, obviously. So we were able to kind of, uh, that community being promoted at the national level also allowed them opportunities to promote Georgetown. And so I think that was that really raised the awareness and allowed people to see what a unique community that we were and what a great retirement opportunity that is. We also have three or uh, four wonderful hospitals right there in our community. So Seton, uh, Seton Williamson County, Seton Hospital, St. David's Georgetown, Scott and White uh, Hospital. So lots of great med medical facilities and clinics there. And then just a great climate obviously, and close to Austin. I mean, that's a draw for so many because of all of the cultural and other opportunities there. But I will say, we have a wonderful theater in Georgia. And you all have it all going. I mean, it's, it's the same um, here, and you have just as many things to offer. Um, but our, our local theater, really, uh, we have a lot of senior citizens that get involved with that at the Palace Theater, both as actors and as patrons, and they really saved that theater for us. It's a little community theater that needed renovating and whatever, and the senior citizens got behind that and uh, saved it, and now it is vibrant. And we have folks coming all over Central Texas to go to the Palace Theater and see the productions there, so. I just wanted to follow up then, because you talk about Austin, which is about 25 miles south of um, Georgetown, but it's all grown together now, right? Yes. Um, I'm wondering what you think, we are close to Kansas City. We're not 25 miles, but we're 40 miles. Mm -hmm. And Kansas City, Lawrence can't compete with a city of that size. You can't compete with Austin. Yeah. We have different things to offer. But should we should we be emphasizing our connections to Kansas City more? Um, I think so. I, I really do because you know that helps us. That what we're seeing is some of the larger festivals things that people come to for Austin, they are choosing to stay in Georgetown like for a weekend. We have cute little guest houses in Old Town now. Um, you know, and so being able to go to those things and then get out into the quaint community to stay and experience that as well offers the best of both worlds. Um, and I think that's part of the draw for our retirees in, in Sun City is that they they have access to so much, the Texas Hill Country, to Austin, to things we have going on in Georgetown. You know, we're a few hours to the Metroplex, we're a few hours to Houston, we're, you know, um, it, it's just central to, to most any place that you want to go. There are good airport facilities, uh, so there's everything, but then you can come home at the end of the day and get, get out into a, a more natural, calmer, quieter environment that's just beautiful and serene. And so I think that just has a, a big draw, but being close to so much is a positive, I think. Well, thank well, you thank all you so much. much. I really enjoyed it.